This is street photographer Richie Perez. Don't be surprised if he pops up in your community because he's been showing up all over Newfoundland and Labrador, meeting folks, taking their picture, but also talking to them and connecting with their stories, their communities. Knowing all of this, The Signal got in touch with Richie to talk about himself, what he does, as well as with some of the folks he's connected to. So we picked a night, we all got together and met up for a chat. Thanks for coming down. Thanks. Good to be here. Cheers. So, you're a busy person. Mm hmm What types of shoots have you been doing lately? So a lot of events. I, uh, I guess a lot of people that see my work online um, reach out and ask if I would do some work for them. So um, I, I have my hands or my, I have my hands in a lot of different opportunities of taking pictures of different things and events. So. How did photography start with you? Start for you because you were so you're so busy now. But what was the beginning of this for for you? Um, I started when uh, this this situation happened when my kids uh, when we were younger or when they were younger, they um, we had a uh, a studio photo shoot and uh, all the kids uh, just like the whole session just fell apart. I decided to go out and buy a camera and document my my kids growing up. And it just spawned off from that. From from there, I got into landscape photography, which was the, really easy to uh, get into because you're not taking pictures of other people, and um, and just uh, got my hands into different things, di or di different uh, different types of photography. How long ago was this? Um, close to ten years ago. Yeah, about 20, 2013, 2014 is when I started getting. Um, questions if I did photography for other other people and so I just started taking pictures for other people and for free and then uh, started posting a, a lot of my pictures on social media and then I realized hey I could uh, I'm getting a, <laughs> I'm getting a lot of people asking me maybe I should start charging so I, so I guess it's that's what you would call professional professional photography or or yeah i know it is so you get it you get in this professional photography uh, after this like real ramp up of people kind of seeing your work and being like hey can you should char char start charging and maybe you can take pictures for us and all this but uh y you meet so many people through this what's that like in terms of finding community and, and all these people you're meeting through photography um it's it's really nice to meet uh all these people that i that uh I meet during during photography because, uh, like, growing up as a kid, I uh, I felt like well, I moved here from the Philippines. I, I was born in Manila. Um, I just remember from the extensive of, of feeling like a like an outsider coming in as an immigrant, even as a kid. Just just the experiences in racism and um, and and just not feeling like I'm part of part of the, the crew or the, the or feeling that there was a community. Um, it, it kind of kept me reserved and I'm sure everyone kind of goes through that something new to an area and um, well for me I thought that not meeting people or getting to hear other people's stories is a missed opportunity and I found the camera doing photography was kind of, a, of an excuse to come up to people and, and not only just capture them but to, to hear, hear who they are who, or what they do and I did that a lot when I when I um, when I walk around doing walkabouts in the downtown St. John's area, and when I traveled back home to the Philippines, um, just getting to know people and, and being able to to uh, talk to them for before I take their pictures. So you're talking about growing up in the '80s through into the '90s in Newfoundland and Labrador, right? In the St. John's area, uh, you mentioned racism. How hard was it then? I mean, obviously hard, but because you mentioned racism. But tell me a bit more about how hard it was to find a sense of belonging here it was it was tough um you know going through school i didn't not didn't fit in almost fit in there were a few friends that uh that i had that i was close to but uh you, no matter how close you were you, you had friends you always felt like you were the outsider the only brown-skinned or or filipino uh, kid going around in 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 the school in the early '80s, and, and uh, the community that I found here was the was the alternative uh, music music scene. Mm. It was uh, 
uh, feeling like I um, I fit in, like just just playing music in the downtown area in the early 90s. That's when I found, like I was, just felt like I was just like everyone else that was playing uh, playing music. So that helped, right? You found this scene. And yeah. Into adulthood, before the picture taken, before you got into photography, yeah. what was it like for just your sense of, the sense of belonging? I think like from people, from being part of a, part of a community like like the initial start of seeing that there was community for me in the arts I guess you'd call it um it helped kind of empower me to to know that you know like it's it's okay to kind of come out of your shell a bit more and it's it's also like just maturing as well and um and yeah and, and I find I find with with especially with photography and the camera having a camera in front of you as your you're kind of like your shield to be able to use that as a, as a way to get closer to people, to kind of come up to people on the street and um, and ask them who they are and if they mind taking pictures, uh, getting their pictures captured by me. And and sometimes it's always not not yes. Mm. And, and 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 that's a thing that you have to learn about rejection. And it, it's just a trial and error, and it's just learning about about myself of how much you can take of 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 that rejection or, or when you, when you hear them say, yeah, you're sure. And, and who are you behind the camera? Like, and you, you, you build this, this conversation to, and, and friendship or relationship between the person that you take pictures of. And that's what I find with, um, as a photographer too, you know, many, many people think that you go out to be a photographer. You gotta, you just go buy a, a, a camera and you go and take someone's picture and take their, their money and, and that's it. But um, I find to get the best picture is is to is the communication is you you find out who these people are, make them comfortable with you, and then you're 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 taking pictures of them of of who they are, of seeing who who they really are. How do you think your growing up with everything you you've mentioned it, it equipped you in a way for what you're trying to do now, or or did it? Um, wiser, I, I guess. Uh, yeah, like I always thought, like if I'm 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 getting older and I don't want to miss the world with just not with my I don't want to miss the world with my head down and walking. That's one of my one of the comments my one of my friends told me was, oh, when you walk around, you you have your head down too, and you look at your feet when you walk around. You should like look up and uh, and 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 like see people make eye contact and and, and talk to people. And um, and so I I I've kind of I've kind of started doing that. Well, I've, I've been doing that, and the and the camera kind of helps me do that as well. And uh, just just to to get away from being introvert and and more extrovert because I'm I'm getting older. I'm not giving a crap about like my appearance much anymore, yeah. or or like how people think of me anymore. I wanna like this was my own my own way of learning about myself and learning about other people as well. Is is just to go out and um, and and hear people's stories and in in any way and um, I I see you know new 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 immigrants who moved here people that are shy that I've seen that I, I can see myself um, in them as well I like to empower those people because I've been there and when those people strike me as a person that I'd like to like the it, it, like the of interest that I like to go out and and hear how if we can relate with the same situations or uh, the, or experiences. So go out, head up, looking at people, eye contact, getting their stories, <laughs> meet new people, and just finding out all this uh, interesting stuff that's well, out there in the world. Right? Yeah. What else is there to do in uh, in this world? I guess. <laughs> We're gonna meet some people tonight. Who do we got coming? Uh, I've got a few friends. Some. Uh, so some people through my journey with photography. Uh, so one of them is a is an old friend that I that I knew growing up in the early '90s, and uh, others I just met within the past year or two from just coming across with them on the street and uh, just asking them if they want wanted a picture or wanted to come around and um, uh, join me on a photo walk. So it's it's uh, it's just a a, a di diverse amount of people that I met through through my my journey of. Yeah, we're going to sit down. Uh, we're going to have some snacks. 
uh, have some tea or coffee or maybe a bubbly beverage and hear about their story and just see like this what you're talking about right how you meet these people and and the stories from the eye contact and and like looking at people through your lens and and getting everything that you get from it so uh, it should be great can't wait let's do it All right, Richie, so we were sitting next to the bar and you said some people were gonna stop by. They're here. Who do we have? So I have my friend Judd, Judd Haynes, uh, an old friend from, from the 90s. And uh, I have Jing Xia. Uh, just met you a few years back. I've seen you playing uh, music uh, around St. John's and, and Florence. Uh, I've, I've seen your parents growing up here um, owning, running a business in Taylor. So Jing, I've met uh, a few years back. In the, I've been seeing you playing your your instrument, your Chinese harp instrument, and I always uh, forget how to pronounce oh, it. Oh, come Ga on. Ju, zu, gu, gu zen. Gu zhen. Gu zhen. You got and, it. Uh, and I just saw that very interesting. I've taken pictures of you uh, playing at events, such as the Sound Symposium. Yeah. So Jing, tell us about yourself then. Like, when did you, you, you arrived here for music? So tell us a little bit more. Sure, uh, so I first came here as an international student in late 2015 to do my PhD and study in ethnomedicology. So I actually just finished this year. I'm so glad that that's done. As a musician, uh, again, I play this Chinese instrument named the Guzhen. It's a traditional instrument, uh, 21 string laser, um, and uh, you know, before I came here, I didn't know if I, you know, I could develop a career as a musician here. And it turned out to be such a wonderful place for it because people just love it. Many people, you know, didn't say it before, but they're just so interested in learning about it. So I, I got many gigs in town and I started to do, you know, this fusion music with uh, musicians from different backgrounds. And uh, yeah, my music life here is just uh, so diverse and uh, wonderful. What do your parents think about the fact that you're still here? Because I think when you came in the beginning, it's, oh, I'm going to school. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, the years are starting to go by a little bit. Yeah, you know, there is a funny thing. Um, um, before I came here, I, I, I never been to this part of Canada. And I thought this uh, city, St. John's, would be some city like Toronto. And uh, I, I think <laughs> that's also uh, what my parents thought. So I, I came here, and it, it turned out to be such a, like a peaceful town and town-like uh, city, which I really like. Because I grew up in you know, a crowded city, and I really like uh, uh, this different atmosphere of people. So do everything kind of slowly but uh, you know, peacefully and uh, so I can have more time to do things you really want. So yeah, and now I stay because again, this music journey here is just so wonderful. I, I just can't resist this uh, world, this music world. Yeah, I saw, what was it, the, uh, there was a recent award, the, the award that you just got a little while ago. Yeah, uh, so I just uh, got this uh, music and now on the world uh, it's called the Rising Star of the Year. Rising Star of the Year. Wow. <laughs> right? Not bad. Oh, Here thanks. we go. Hey, yeah, good job. I, yeah, I'm really uh, grateful for all this community support. Yeah. Tell us about Florence. Uh, well, Florence, we just met. I, I just met you a few years, a, a few years ago, out on out on uh, Duckworth Street on on the road. Uh, I was out on a photo walk with a few friends. And uh, I saw Florence out there with a camera. So I, I came up to her and I asked you, I said, uh, would you like to join us? And uh, I noticed you have a camera and, uh, and later finding out that I've seen your parents and their business at the, uh, at our, at, at, at the mall uh, growing up here. And I just found it interesting to know that, like to see that, um, that I, I, there, was a, there was an Asian, Asian business in, at the mall here back in the early 80s. 80s. Uh, I just found that interesting because back in the day, there weren't many, uh, it wasn't that diverse in, in Newfoundland. Mm. And th their, uh, their tailor business was, uh, was out there. Um, and Florence, uh, we, we, we got to know each other. You do a little bit of streaming, you're into gaming. Yeah. And 
So. Let's go into that. Like, start with, I guess, uh, growing up here uh, with your, you know, with your your family and the family business, and then we can talk a little bit more about streaming and gaming and everything else you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, my parents they ran a tailor shop um, since eight, 1986. And um, yeah, so I basically just really grew up in that environment, and I like they <laughs> because it was just them who uh, who were here. So I guess when they were uh, when they were raising me, I was basically raised up in the shop, and I um, I saw like everything that was going on like behind the scenes, like how they fixed everybody's clothes, and I I would you know come out and uh, like when. Obviously, when I was older, I uh, I helped them out. I did all the storefront um, uh, side of things, and and I helped you know help them do like just some of the easier tasks um, when they needed help. Um, yeah, and uh, it was uh, it was it was a very interesting experience. And um, they they were I mean they were constantly working. So you know I um, I would often um, I, I would often be hanging around the shop just uh, just to make sure that uh, you know they were able to uh, to get enough help for what they needed to do. And, uh, okay, great. Uh, and then you grow up, and what do you start doing? Uh, so I uh, I graduated at uh, PwC, and I went to uh, I went to Mun and did an education degree, and I graduated um, ten years ago. <laughs> And I ended up, I did some substitute teaching here and then uh, for about two years and then I, um, I went abroad to Korea and taught English and then um, after I finished up uh, there after a year I actually went over to the UK to, uh, to get more experience as a primary elementary school teacher. And I came back here and decided to go back to school and study software development. So you're studying software development, and uh, how did you get into streaming? Oh, so that was uh, funny. Funnily enough, um, I met uh, I met some classmates in my program, and they were really into computers, and they were also streaming. And I actually got curious about uh, what that was all about. Like, I wanted to build my own computer. Uh, like, I guess in my first year of the program. And because there's like nothing, you know, nothing really I could do was during the pandemic. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to learn how to build a computer. And I got a friend's help to buy all the parts. And once everything, you know, got brought in, um, it was really funny because we weren't allowed to visit each other at the time. So I had my friend on like a, on a voice a video call story. And he was just showing me where everything went and just making sure everything was OK. And then I, you know, once I've built everything, I was like, yeah, this is for school. Like, this is, this is fine. Like, this is for school. I can justify the cost of it. Like, that's going to be for educational purposes. And then, and then I started buying games on it. And then, <laughs> and then after that happened, I was like, I wonder what would happen if I like decided to stream it because it was actually something I wanted to um, to do for a long time. But I was like, this is never going to happen because I had a laptop and I just didn't think that was going to work with uh, what I had. Uh, so I was like, well, this is my opportunity opportunity to try it and uh, yeah and that's how I ended up in streaming cool <laughs> yeah just to kill kill time <laughs> Judd so this is my friend Judd we we met from the early 90s and uh, we stayed in touch uh, Judd's a graphic designer a musician and um, and good friend of mine uh, we kind of live parallel lives with design work in the IT industry and uh, yeah it's just uh, a good friend that I stayed in touch with Fill us in on the rest of yourself there, Judd. Uh, well, as Richie said, I'm a graphic designer and an illustrator. Mm -hmm. And I, for many years, those were my sideline gigs because I played music for a living mm -hmm. for almost a decade. And uh, But then a bunch of years ago, I switched back and went back to doing illustration and design. And that's kind of my main gig these days, mostly designing stuff for the music industry. And But over the last few years, I started doing a lot of stuff with certain TV shows and indie films, too. So it's been a lot of fun. Talking to you, to you folks before, uh, I find all of your stories really interesting because you all have, obviously, I mean, everyone has a different story, right? But everyone here, you, as your stories connect to Richie, I just find them really interesting. So for you, your parents were like, was it your dad that was in the military? Yeah, my father was in the military, yeah. So what was it like kind of coming here at that time, trying to 
find a sense of belonging or to fit in at the same time when you're meeting Richie? Uh, well, I was, a, because I was an army brat, it's like we moved to a new city like every three years. And so I was always the new guy. Yeah. And as a kid, that's really a huge adjustment. So you're always moving in as the new person. Uh, and then just when you start to get some roots and start to kind of fit in a little bit, you're uprooted and thrown into another, another town and you start over again. So around the time that I met Richie, um, was around, I didn't know anybody really. Like I, you know, I was suddenly living in Newfoundland and had no roots and didn't know anybody. And so I went to the mall because they had a great arcade. Same here. Yeah. <laughs> and so I saw they had pinball machines and they had Tekken and Tetris. And so I went to the mall. And, uh, but I didn't really know anybody. Like when I first met, met Richie, he was one of the first people that I met here. What was it like growing up? We're talking as we're moving through the 90s uh, in Newfoundland. Uh, you know, so this is Cobb Moratorium time. Uh, economy wasn't great. So as you're growing up and trying to find what you want to do with your lives, what was that like? Uh, it was really uh, desperate, and you didn't have a lot of hope for the future, in all honesty. Like, I mean, without being too dark about it, it's like that era, we saw all the adult figures losing their jobs, having to go back to school and learn new things. They, they thought they, were, they you know, had careers, and suddenly all their careers were taken from them. And here we were, the young kids coming through high school, seeing that happen, and then looking at our future and going, like, what are we going to do? You know, if there's nothing for them, what's, what are we supposed to do? And uh, I remember it just being really scary. And most people I knew who were in university, they were like doing masters in universities and working at fast food jobs because that was the only work you could get. And uh, yeah, I mean, St. John's and Newfoundland in the 90s was, uh, was a dark spot. Yeah, because both of you are a little bit older than me. I was coming through in the late 90s for my teens. And for me, it was like, uh, not a lot of jobs around. So I ended up going in the reserves, trying to go through Mun. And then I ended up going to South Korea to work because I didn't know what else to do, and there wasn't ex like the opportunity of the oil boom years wasn't really there yet, and I just kind of was following a bunch of other folks from the trends that were that were set in the '90s. But when you were in South Korea, what was the the talk about going? Because this was way more recent than way back when I was there than when we were talking about. Um, well, amongst my peers, it wasn't very uh, it wasn't very popular. Like I would say, one other friend of mine expressed interest in it, but it wasn't something that felt like you know they were being pulled into into doing because they didn't have to so most I think most um, most of my peers never really um, got into the idea of traveling that far away mm -hmm. yeah. what did it give you for traveling and, and being because there's also there's another connection with culture for you being in Korea for just in that that Asia Pacific region too right yeah it was um, for me it was actually a really great opportunity for me to sort of uh, be more independent and I you know I felt like this was really good for me to sort of get out of my shell because I was very I was I would say I was very introverted and I was a lot more I would say socially awkward <laughs> before I left and I felt like by traveling alone <laughs> and living on my own I um, at the time I didn't realize it but I felt like I learned a lot about myself by doing that and I felt like that was that that was the push I needed to be a better version of myself. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I was, I was very glad that I did it. And I, you know, if anybody came up to me and said, yeah, I really wanna like go teach abroad or like go abroad for a bit, like I encouraged them <laughs> to go because it was one of the best experiences I've had. But as you're doing that, the economic times were better uh, for Newfoundland and Labrador. What was it like kind of looking back home and thinking about here as you're kind of doing it? Because when, back when I was doing it, it was like, well, I don't know how good the economy is, and then I finally got this message of like, oh, things are doing pretty well back home. Maybe I'll go back home and uh, try to get a job. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. I think when it was here, and probably it wasn't as dire as say in the '90s, but it a lot of a lot of my friends still had to move away because a lot of their jobs were very specialized and they had to leave. So unless you were in the oil and gas industry, um, it, a lot of my a lot of my peers and of course myself, we uh, didn't feel like there wasn't too much here, and uh, that's and that was another reason I decided to to leave to just find more opportunity. The music scene in the '90s. What was it like back then, and how has it changed? Well, the first thing that I see or saw was the uh, the lack of diversity. Definitely, yeah. Because I mean, you were there with me. Yeah, I was about to say I was there with Richie the whole time, and it was you know basically it was you and one other person were our cultural diversity, and um, but. It, the big thing too, like, was also the gender uh, was problem was that almost no women played music back then. 
You mm. know, we had we had Liz Picard and we had Colleen and you know we had yeah. a few others, Natalie. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. you, you could count them on one hand, and uh, it's really really scary when you look back at it now. At the time, I don't even know if a lot of us even realized. Yeah. Uh, but now it was just normal. But and and that's what I see with Jing as when I first saw you performing at the at the at the St. John's Community Center and, and the Sound Symposium events. I just found that very interesting to see you and you actually lived here. Because Judd, Judd mentioned when these events went off, they would they would fly people in from, from Tibet or from other yeah. places to perform, but to, to know that you you live here and you're you you've studied music and you're your, um, you've done your PhD. Yeah, yeah. I think my PhD actually helped me a lot, especially at the beginning, because uh, again, my instrument is a Nijirara, and um, I the first music thing I went into is kind of the classic music uh, happening in university. So I played a lot in the the cook hall, the university halls, and with. Uh, with uh, other musicians, and uh, especially improvisation. That's, uh, that's a new field for me, uh, because I never did the improvisation when I was learning my instruments right. in China. Uh, and I got very excited about that, because here I found that uh, everybody's just like uh, grab their instrument and start to play. Yeah. <laughs> that's amazing, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's why I really into um, that improvisation. And I, I, I think that's a great opportunity for you to, to to, to be living here, to move here from China, to, to make a living off it. Yeah, I, so like you guys said all these uh, things back in the 90s, I can't imagine it because now the, the Newfoundland is just so diverse and so mm -hmm. like supportive um, in terms of uh, this multiculturalism. So I don't, that's amazing to see how it changes like all these years and like, how it evolves, yeah. So, so Florence, for you growing up, then is it? Do you identify with much of what Richie's saying or what Jing is saying? Um, yeah, actually, a lot of the things that Richie have said has resonated with me growing up because um, when I was growing up, like I was for the longest time, I was the only Asian kid in the class, and it was really hard to um, to share my experiences with uh, with like with somebody my age or much and probably and let alone a friend um, because they wouldn't be able to experience those same like nuances well, one of the experiences we talked about was the, the, that we've both experienced was the the lunch the lunches in our schools here was when our parents used to make us our traditional dishes for lunch and we would get uh, we would get tormented by the the, the different smell and the, the different look of, of our lunches. And uh, that would, that would lead, us, lead us into making, uh, for us to go back to our parents and saying that we don't want our, the, these lunches anymore and uh, we want the regular ham and cheese sandwiches that everyone else in, in the class wants or that, that's been, uh, that they have for lunch. Yeah, exactly. So. Um, I think, <laughs> yeah, so that's a big one for me was, um, was food from uh, being, being brought into school from home where, you know, I loved eating it when I was at home, but then when I brought to school, I was terrified. Like, I did not want to bring it to school. I wanted to, like, to throw it in the bin because I knew I was going to get made fun of. And it was, and, uh, I mean, unfortunately, it had happened, and I got so much anxiety from bringing food from home. So for the longest time, I was very, like, insecure about mm -hmm. my own culture because Sorry. of that, just because I, it was so different. And... And the way kids reacted to, I guess, children who are different, it's just like they didn't know what to do. They, you know, make fun of them, make fun of the kids, or or they would just be like, you know, they would be like surprised, but like it's like, oh my god, like yeah. What is that? Yeah, like oh my god, what is that? <laughs> yeah. When you're traveling, did it? Because I know you got to visit Vietnam when you're living in South Korea, right? I did, but um, actually, the first time I visited Vietnam was when I was twelve. So I was, uh, I, I went there with, uh, with my mom, um, like, yeah, like I said, when I was uh, over the summer when I was 12 for about two and a half weeks to visit my grandmother and then my mom's side of the family who I've actually never met before. And it was, um, that was probably like, it was a, it was a very, like, it was a shock to my system. Um, 
that's what it was because it was just stepping off the plane and not being used to not just getting used to the atmosphere there. It's just because it's I'm just so used to the Newfoundland weather that when I I basically like <laughs> stepped off the plane, like I just I remember just feeling that that brick of hot air just hitting my face and just different smells. It's just it was just like it was it was a very like it was a very interesting interesting experience. Um, and I just never had any real connection to my culture growing up until I went to Vietnam. Like it was like I I couldn't speak a word of Vietnamese growing up because like because at, at home because I went into school um, and we spoke English. So at home I spoke English with my parents, uh, but I could understand what they were saying when they were speaking to each other because they spoke to each other in Vietnamese. Um, so when I was over there, I couldn't like. I think I just had anxiety just speaking it, like, because I was so, I just didn't have, I wasn't confident enough. So in my, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that was, that was really rough. Um, I remember the first week was a struggle. So I always had to relay everything to my mom to, like, talk to my grandmother. And afterwards, I think I was like, okay, I think I need to, like, actually, you know, try to, try to speak. And it was, it was a slow process. And, um, yeah, a lot of, I had a lot of like, I guess, learning experiences about, I guess, learning about um, different aspects of my culture, just like etiquette um, mostly and learning more about the food and learning more about um, just about my family, my, my mom's side of the family um, and yeah, just how they, I guess, you know, how, how they grew up over there. And so what did all this give you as you, like forming the adult you, what did all this, the, 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 the 12 year old trip, then the travel and also visits back, what did all this kind of equip you with to become who you were? Um, I, I felt that it uh, really showed me that I'm, uh, that I'm able to adapt in a new environment. I was able to, you know, I can, I, it, it taught me that I'm, that I'm a very, that I can be a very independent person when I let myself uh, uh, do that. Um, and I very much like I, I really like when I can I try to rely on myself to get you know to get from point A to B and yeah just to kind of go for it like if I really want to do something and I'm like in like a new place like you know just just do it like what's the worst that could happen. Yeah, what's the worst that can happen? You come to Newfoundland, you get a PhD, and then you get a music award. Exactly, yes. Yeah. So just explore things. We are still young. <laughs> we can do things. You were? Yeah. No, no. Oh, we are all young. But, but yeah, who knows? Just try. Uh, I feel like my current status is just trying things mm -hmm. and to see uh, which field I really want to like, uh, to be committed in. That. So. So yeah, that's my current status. What did travel give you? It gave me independence of uh, coming out of a divorce. Yeah. <laughs> I was just self-reliant or self uh, dependent on, on, on a lot of things in the past. And uh, it gave me more empathy to see things that I've never seen growing up in Canada. Just seeing the dark sides of, of life, of uh, home, homelessness. I know there is, there is, that's an issue here in Canada, but there's, uh, just seeing it in a different way, where where I uh, where I went to travel and where I was born and where I thought that I could live my life, um, if if my life was out there, could I have been in that situation? Just different things. Um, um, it just um, it helped me want to know more about uh, my culture and uh, also. With with the photography journey as well, like the, they they called it street photography, mm. just uh, going out and capturing uh, capturing things, uh, seeing your experiences through the glass, uh, helped me uh, meet people, uh, come out of uh, come out of my shell to be able to talk and hear other people's stories. It's a lot, right? It's great mm -hmm. when you get to go out and you meet new folks or folks you reconnect with so that you've known when you're younger and then to kind of hear their stories and then to keep getting in touch with them. I mean, that's, I find it a really interesting part of, for you and me following you, is you found like as, as I look at this kind of big, gigantic community that you're building, because anytime I've been out with you walking around for work, Everyone's like, hey, Richie, hey, Richie, hey, Richie. And like, it keeps happening. You know so many people. The king of Kensington. <laughs> oh, hello there. <laughs> hello. Well, Richie, Richie has this gift of people come to you all the time, strangers. And uh, I, when we first started reconnecting, and we were going out skateboarding a lot together and things like this, mm. and uh, 
you know, kids would come over uh, to myself and Richie because we'd have skateboards. So kids would come over to us and Richie would immediately start talking to the kids and be like showing them how to skateboard and all this kind of stuff. And myself, not having kids, I was uncomfortable by this whole situation at first. I would be like, should we be talking to the kids in the park? Like I feel like, <laughs> like we're probably not supposed to be doing this. And, um, but the parents would come over, kids would come over, like everybody would come over because Richie just has that personality where people feel comfortable immediately. You bring everybody in. Uh, I mean, we've had so many amazing times in the park, uh, meeting people from mm -hmm. all over the world. Yeah. yeah, and coming over, and you're putting, it it's blows my mind, because you're putting people on skateboards, a lot of them, you can tell, have never, ever, ever stepped foot <laughs> on a skateboard, and you get them to do it. You know, whereas I went and probably went, walked over to them and said, you should try this, they would just walk away immediately. But, but Richie no, they're has, yelling stranger danger. And yeah, <laughs> yeah. But Richie has, a, has a, a way that you make people feel comfortable, and... And, and willing to try something that they probably wouldn't normally do. Thing is, is I, I, I don't remember, there weren't many people of my generation growing up. You know, I've, I've had a few people, um, you know, thank a lot of people for kind of helping me grow up, but uh, I just want to give back to, to seeing a few people there that are, introvert or too shy to come out and you know like you see someone there that's like watching you can almost sense through body language yeah. that they want to participate or join in on the fun or or just be part of a community and that's what I try to do is I I try to just be that person to just kind of lure um, the the like people that I meet to come in and join and be part of Part of this, because uh, yeah, like, yeah I, I sometimes see and I, I have that empathy on, on someone on, on the street that, uh, that you see that's on their own. And you, 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 I just feel like it's my job to go and say, hey, how's it going? Uh, what are you doing? Who are you? Or mm. you want to you wanna join us? And that's what I did with you, is you were out there by yourself, I think, with, waiting for your friend. But, uh, yeah. but uh, I, I just feel... Like that, that's satisfaction for me to, to do that. And I, know, and I invited myself to your house to, wow. to interview you for a hot pot. <laughs> well, we had a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah, I remember the first time I met Richie, like that was our like very first time meeting each other. And he was like my old friend and just talking to me like old friend, that, that kind of style. And I was like, oh, he is interesting, you know? And then that's how we, um, we finally like a, decided to form a band together to play music together because it turns he's out he's also a killer guitar player yes, yes. exactly <laughs> yes yes yeah Richie is uh, fantastic everybody knows Richie and everybody loves Richie I had to start filling the back of my car with skateboards when I would go to meet <laughs> Richie because I knew that we, if we only bring one board each, we're not going to get to get on a board ourselves because Richie's going to invite the entire park to come and ride oh. our skateboards. So I started bringing four or five skateboards in the back of the car, and we just throw them in the grass. And as people would come over to see Richie, then they could, then he would encourage them to try it. And then there was boards for everybody, basically. Uh, that was pretty neat, cr kind of creating our own little community. It was out really there. fun. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's, let's keep it going once the snow's gone. Yes. How many people? have you kind of run into for photography, for street photography, in the course of like this year or the last couple of years? It, like, it's a lot, right? Yeah, I, I can't count the, the, the amount of people. Well, St. John's is small too, so sometimes you come across the similar people and you have different conversations with them, but, but yeah, you, like, you, you just, uh, any person that I've never met before, I'm willing to kind of get to know them and, and capture them and just see, see if they're, they're having a good day or bad day. What are some of the things that are, that are striking you from these conversations lately of the, you know, the St. John's or the Newfoundland and Labrador now compared to the one that we were talking about when you were growing up? There, I think there's a sense of community and I think there's, there's, there's stories to be told. There's a, everyone, everyone is unique. Jeff, what do you think about nowadays? Is like for you a business person, like the, the province that we're working in, living in now uh, compared to when, you know, someone who, as you said, you know, you're an army brat moving in? Yeah, I mean, it's obviously the... The city, the province has changed so drastically much, and I, I would love it. I'm actually like a huge fan of all the change, because uh, again, the 90s for us, while it was really fun for us musically, mm -hmm. uh, but if we 
really look back at that period of time, really that's all it was. It was like for all, a lot of us, it was like we, we were young kids who started bands. We had a great time playing music. And nowadays I feel like it's everything. Like city can really offer anything. The province offers everything. And uh, I don't know, people do seem to like pursue their dreams and chase things a lot more now. And you've seen some success stories too, which has been really cool. Because when I was a kid, we didn't have anybody that I was a role model to look up to that was even had made it or had done anything. There wasn't authors that were being celebrated across the country. We had great artists. We had, you know, if you look back to the generation right before ours, we had like the David Blackwoods and the Christopher Pratts and Newfoundland had celebrated visual artists, but that was kind of about it, you know? And uh, even in the, the TV and film world, we had Gordon Pinsent, but there wasn't many others. Mm -hmm. And then through the 90s, we saw the rise of so many huge personalities from Newfoundland uh, and TV, radio, you know, theater, authors, musicians, you know, Great Big C went on and sold millions of records and not like hundreds of records like our bands would have. And, uh, and it was just like suddenly it was like, oh, wait, we can do whatever we want. Mm -hmm. And it's really cool to see that. I feel, I hope that the generations coming through now uh, feel that and do feel that they can do whatever they want and go for it. Lawrence, you're part of the, I mean, you're not the generation that's coming, but you're still younger than, like, the three of the, the guys at the table. How are you feeling about, like, where we are now uh, and, and, like, the community that you're in for the with the province? Yeah, I, I've actually seen a lot of change, I would say, in the, at least in the last decade, like, at the very least, and it's really nice to see that it's becoming more diversified. There's, I feel like we're, um, yeah, a lot of people just want to come here because they love the 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 outdoors, they love the scenery, and it's just, we, we do have a lot to offer, and, and I think it's nice that there's uh, a lot of people coming in and realizing that, and it's uh, nice to bring, like, I guess, new talent and, like, new ideas to be brought here so that um, Newfoundland can be, you know, can grow to its full potential, and, and it's nice that now, um, like, for example, we're expanding our industry where you know the tech industry is booming. growing yeah it's mm -hmm. booming and it's nice that that's something that's um being realized here and uh, hopefully that will uh m like incentivize people to stay here or even move here and just make um yeah make uh, newfoundland really uh, really amazing and stay here I and mean, like you know i don't know buy a house in paradise is it <laughs> yes paradise <laughs> and how's that going well um i so far, so good, mm -hmm. and uh, it, again, it's a peaceful place. I enjoy staying there, you know, and especially during the pandemic, you know, um, we just uh, basically stay uh, at home. And uh, Paradise is such a it's a new area, and it's very quiet all the time, and not <laughs> a lot of traffic or that kind of thing. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, and I, last time I heard Richie say that the Paradise used to be a it was like a, a rural area. Or yeah, like, yeah, but now it's kind of so it's like modern a, and the new. So yeah, it's a great place. And um, yeah, and we, we decided to um, buy a house there because we want to settle down, just uh, form a family. And um, yeah, just love this city and uh, settle down. We started, we were having a drink, having a chat about your photography. Uh, you talked about introducing us to some folks, which you did. When are you going back out to take street photography? I'll, uh, I'll probably go out this weekend, actually, and just uh, get some free time when I'm less busy. I'll uh, go out. Eyes up, looking at people, talking. Mm -hmm. All right. yep. Richie, thank you so much for this, and thanks to you guys, too. This has been great. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. All right.